Okay, it's two o'clock. Hi, everybody. Good to see you. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about reading guides today. and I'm going to show you some typical ones and some atypical ones. So uh, let me share my screen. I've got a, little, a few slides that we'll look at. Okay, so um, there we go. So the whole point here is to help students connect to the text. Um, I'll lay my cards on the table. I view these as ungraded or very lightly graded activities. Uh, but you know, we all organize our courses as we do. So what's, uh, what's in for today? So we'll talk a tiny bit about theory, so we'll, which is the why bother part. Uh, we'll look at, uh, I think I've got four formats we can look at, and we'll talk just a tiny bit about tools. Oh, and we're talking about getting some student buy-in as well. So uh, in my earlier life, I was a reading specialist. And so this is how anybody who works with reading thinks about a reading assignment as a three-part activity. It's got a before, a during, and after. And that pulls straight from contemporary um, learning theory that we have to be primed to learn and have some kind of focus, be paying attention. We have to be actively engaged while we're doing whatever the learning activity is. And that some kind of pulling the material back again is always helpful. So it's nothing more than learning theory 101. Uh, let's get your faces out of here. Um, and so, you know, we'll look at before we might be thinking about what's a, what's a piece or two of prior knowledge that I want to supply or often that I simply want to activate. You know, students tend to think that if I learned it in another course or in another chapter, I never need to think about it again. So just that reminder of when you study blah, blah. Uh, typically and, and particularly no, uh, novice students, uh, don't always know where to focus. So helping people figure out where the, where the focus goes. And then, you know, build a little bit of enthusiasm for it. You know, I was watching somebody's PowerPoint on the Flip Academy, and it was fun to hear all about her favorite or, organ, the kidney. Um, and uh, so she brought a lot of enthusiasm to it. During, we want to focus on active engagement with the text. And I want to talk just a tiny bit there. Um, there's a fair amount of research on what students do when they read, and it's a stampede to the least effective things. They typically open up the book, start without thinking at all what it's about or what they want to get out of it. They'll stop whenever they stop, you know, when the dog barks, when they want to coke, whatever, so they don't read in meaningful units. Um, they tend to have a highlighter in their hand and they turn the page yellow. All of those are pretty much passive strategies. And so if we can nudge them towards two things, three things, reading to answer a question or two, um, annotating a text rather than highlighting it. So uh, writing something in the margin, if they can't bring themselves to do that, write them on a post-it note, use the marking tool and an, an electronic text, but put down that highlighter. Um, and finally, read in meaningful chunks um, rather than, you know, so get to the end of a logical unit and say, okay, what was the point here? Uh, and we will come back to that when we talk about the reading guide, because we want to do some things in the reading guides to kind of help nudge students in that direction. And then afterwards, application, uh, connecting, and simply retrieving the information more than once. All of those are useful. So, that's all I'm going to say really about during and after. Most of this then is going to be about before and because that's where reading guides are useful. So let's talk about the first one, which is simply to provide one or maybe two guiding questions. Uh, and the hassle factor here is one, barely a one. This is so minimal an effort that, you know, I, I would think, why wouldn't I do that? Uh, so here's an example from the course that's keeping me awake at night because I'm not nearly as ready for it as I should be. But as you read this assignment, consider how Lisa uses Halliday's notions of learning about language and learning through language. As you annotate your text, nudge, nudge, note examples of her students engaged in each kind of learning. 
So this is an example of something you can just pop right under the assignment, you know, the link, the page numbers, whatever. In the case of the book I'm working with, it's what we call in my business, a theory into practice book. So most of what we see is the first five days of this woman's kindergarten class. Um, and the theory is pretty lightly applied around the edges. And so novice students like mine would miss it without this kind of, this kind of help. Um, and again, my rationale in doing this is simply uh, to, you know, to provide some, um, some focus. Notice this piece of theory. And I don't think you can see that under the captions. Okay, the second one's a video introduction. Bonnie and I were chit-chatting back and forth about all the logistics of doing that. Um, I'd say the hassle factor there is about a two, maybe a three if we have to go through stream. Um, and in the case of this one that I'm gonna show you, or at least a little bit of it, it's to, um, to fill in some missing prior knowledge. Again, same book, this theory into practice book that my students will be reading the first week of class. And um, the authors drop in a specialized term without really talking about it. And it's the kind that's particularly bothersome because it has an everyday meaning. And if you apply the everyday meaning, eh, you'll be able to keep on trucking with the text, but you're gonna miss the, the subtleties. So let's take a quick look at what that looks like. Hi, in your reading assignment, you are going to run across the term approximation, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about it. So, um, you know the everyday meaning, an approximation is like an estimate, but it's clear it's being used in a more specialized way, uh, and it comes from linguistics, from the study of language acquisition. So children's gradually more correct attempts to use some aspect of information are called approximation. Uh, this is important because it changes our orientation to what we see. Okay, that's probably enough of that. You've kind of got the idea. It's only a minute and a half. Uh, and again, it just focuses on the one bothersome uh, piece of information that they're very unlikely to have. So it's filling in a bit of missing prior knowledge. The third one is a favorite of mine. It's called a two column journal. It's something students could keep on paper or electronically. Let's just sort of visualize it on paper. You draw a, you know, a, um, a line uh, down uh, vertically down about a third of your page. And um, on one side uh, in the left column, you write some short excerpt from the text. In the right column, you explain why you chose the excerpt. So that's in the most general, generic kind of way. But let's look at some examples of what that could look like. And again, I probably like it better electronically because students are going to want to just, you know, uh, copy and paste that little piece of text in there. And there's no reason they shouldn't do that. Um, but um, I first saw this in somebody's literature class, and they were studying. Uh, characterization, the ways that authors reveal characters to their readers. And so the assignment was to choose one of two or three characters and um, record three or four things where they felt they had learned something about the character. So that was the piece that went in the left column. In the right, they talked about how this piece of character, characterization was working. So it was where they connected to what they were doing in the classroom. Um, so it works real nicely in that kind, you know, in that kind of thing, it works really nicely for little. Uh, but it could work for um, many different kinds of things. Let's make that go away. Um, uh, and again, I, probably would not leave it totally open-ended. Um, but one way that people do do it is uh, in the left column, write down something that was puzzling. And in the left column, something that was, you know, what's your question about it? Another kind of really open-ended ver version of it in the left column, um, write down something that reminds you of something else in this course. 
or connects to this course or connects to another reading or connects to a lab experience. And in the, in the right hand column, you make the connection. Um, another one uh, in, a, in the kind of more informational text, you could find, uh, let's say a big idea that the author gives, you know, several uh, examples of. So you put the big idea and in the, uh, in the right column, you generate your own novel example. So elaborating like that is again, a way to build comprehension. Uh, making connections as the previous, my previous example talked about, another way to build comprehension. Um, and again, in, in each case, the idea is to focus on some particular aspects of the text, but again, you could encourage students to make connections, uh, to elaborate on what they're reading. Uh, there, there are different possible rationales. And again, I said hassle factor of one or two because setting one of these up is easy, easy, easy. It's a one, barely a one at that. Uh, a two is depends on how much of it you read. And we're gonna be talking about the reading issue for you in a minute. And finally, um, the series of questions. This is the most, uh, I would say, traditional kind of reading guide. We have a series of questions. They show up in the order that appear in the text. They help students pay attention to what's important. You know, they are really kind of a, a friendly hand guiding somebody through the, the text. Um, for, um, I think they're particularly helpful for text where organization is really important. So uh, some of my colleagues over in the Dreben School in, uh, uh, in courses where students are reading um, research studies for the first time. And you know how important the, the structure of a research study is. The reading guide is organized around the research study, asked one or two pertinent questions about each um, you know, phase of the, of the study. And again, helps highlight, push right up to the surface that organizational structure that can be so useful. Another thing that this kind of thing can do is you know, highlight the tricky point. So there'll be a place where something is tricky, doesn't make sense, whatever. Another thing that you could do with this kind of reading guide is um, key them to a table or a figure that is particularly important. And maybe your students are different than mine, but mine tend to gloss right over the tables, the figures and all that. Uh, and so something that directs their attention directly to those and reads them through the process of first reading what it says and then thinking about what you might uh, infer from what you see there. So, um, and I like using uh, the Blackboard quiz um, tool for creating these, but we'll talk about that when we get to tools. Let's first get to what uh, you're probably asking yourself already, how can I do this and not you know, kill myself reading all this stuff? Um, and that's a very reasonable question. And it's one you wanna kind of think about uh, because it will have a lot to do with um, you know, how you shape these things. Um, I try to keep in mind that the most important thing here is what the student is doing. And so I try really hard not to frame it as an, ex as an activity where my goal is to find out what they know. So this is one where I am going to score generously and that if I score at all, and that the doing is what gets you the points. Uh, let's look at what that could look like. So um, First thing you might think about is what is it you want the student to actually do as they go through this reading guide. And so the first thing might simply be to annotate their text. So the, my first two examples, the, the, the single guiding question or the short little video, they instructed students simply to annotate their text. I'm not going to look at their textbooks. You know, so what I'm doing is coaching them on how it is that experienced readers handle a challenging text. The second thing you can do to kind of lighten your load on this is to think about the notes that students will create from a reading guide as uh, raw material for some other kind of uh, assignment. 
Uh, and so you might have built into your course some kind of assignment where students uh, talk to each other, collaborate a little bit. So maybe a discussion board. I'm probably going to be using Padlet. We'll have little weekly team meetings and they'll have a sh very simple assignment that they'll post on Padlet. But they're going to be bringing their notes from the reading guide to that to that experience. Flipgrid, the same kind of idea, except they're posting little videos. So here, I would say in the in my guide, you know, as you do this, um, no, be sure that you realize that you'll need these notes for your discussion board question. You'll need them for your team meeting when you create your graded Padlet assignment. So while I don't grade the discussion um, guides, I may not even look at them. Uh, I have them, um, they become raw material for the, the, uh, these collaborative activities. And when students do sketchy, superficial, you know, lousy work, um, the first thing I'll, I say is, oh, where are your notes from your discussion guide? Let's talk about how you could have actually said something that made a little bit more, uh, had a little bit more meat on it. Um, and I find I only have to do that about once and then they, they you know, break down to do it. The other, uh, the other thing is to use the notes in formal writing. So um, in this uh, course that's keeping me away, the first paper they write uh, gets written in two pieces. The first piece is just a simple little narrative about remembering what it was like when they learned to write. And then the second piece, it doubles that, paper, that first draft in size and uses a lot of the material from the textbook to do the kind of analysis that we expect in academic writing. So uh, the instructions for the paper are going to say that you'll need your reading guide um, uh, notes for, to do your paper. It'll make it much easier for you to do your paper. And besides, I'll like, I want you to attach your, uh, your notes to your paper. So all of those are things that take that reading off of your plate. And what they essentially do is um, make them tools for students to use. Occasionally, uh, I will have students turn in a completed reading guide, typically pretty early in the semester or for a particularly uh, important uh, thing. When I do those, I grade them lightly. Uh, it's essentially I skim them. Any good hearted attempt gets full credit. I make a note of where people had trouble and then I do a group response and I don't do a lot of individual marking on them. Um, and so, um, you know, my, uh, you know, my, my reading on this is, I think, manageable and most of it folds into assignments I was going to give anyway and I was going to be reading anyway. And it helps students do those assignments uh, more, more successfully. Okay, so any lightly graded assignment, any sign assignment that focuses on the process of learning rather than um, the content um, is one that needs a little bit of selling. So you don't necessarily have to be the used car salesman in the lot, but it, it wouldn't hurt. Um, so um, students are inclined to think of these you know, things as, um, as busy work because uh, in the, uh, an article I read, I'll never forget, the guy you was talking about why students have difficulty sometimes enga engaging in some of the most useful things we want them to do. And the phrase he used was mistaken epistemology. Uh, in other words, they have mistaken ideas about how learning works. And so if they have a, the naive notion that learning is something that happens when we talk to them and pour things into their heads, they're going to be a little bit more resistant to these kinds of assignments. Uh, so the degree to which over the course of a semester we can nudge them over uh, to a, a, a little bit more sophisticated notion of how learning works, the notion that says their effort is the crucial piece, the better off we are. But you know the old saying, meet them where they are. So I meet them first in terms of a graded assignment. That's why most of these reading guide uh, options that I've suggested are tied to a graded piece of work. 
grades are what they understand, that grades are where they are initially focused. And so these are things which while lightly graded themselves or even ungraded themselves will help you do better on the graded assignment. And, uh, you know, if I've got a class that I think needs a little extra push, I might even say, and you will need to connect, collect, uh, you know, connect this to your graded assignment. Um, I try not to stop there. I mean, I think that's a starting point, but I try gradually over time to focus their attention on, on how learning works a little bit. Um, because there's, there's pretty nice evidence that students who focus on the learning piece rather than the grade piece in generally learn more and get better grades. Um, so it's worth it to, to think a little bit about selling these things. And typically that's in terms of what's in it for them. Okay, let's talk about tools a little bit. Um, I like use for the, the kind of traditional reading guide, that series of questions where we're gonna walk students through a text. I like using the Blackboard uh, test tool. I'm gonna you know, you know, admit right up front though, I teach moderate size classes, uh, rarely anything over 30. Uh, so I'm not sure I could make it work in a big class. You know, I would really have to think about that. But here's how it works you know, in, a, in a smaller or moderate size class. Uh, you go into the tool, you, know, you make a note of the questions you wanna ask. Uh, and I do each of the, um, the questions I'm going to ask them is simply a short answer item in the, in the Blackboard quiz thing. So you can create all kinds of items. Um, and I just create a bunch of short answer items. They have a place then to record their, their answers. It, where I need to, there's a place where I can also add a little bit of explanatory text. So you can, you can insert, in, insert a little bit of text as well. Uh, in the, in the uh, grading options, uh, there is um, an option which makes this an ungraded event. I think it's unchecking something that says um, uh, use in grade calculation. So you uncheck that and it doesn't get graded. Uh, and then I also, in those settings down there, I make it something that they can uh, access unlimited time. So, you know, I will go through, I'll take a look at them, I'll skim them, I'll give anybody who's finished it, I'll, I'll give them some participation points. I won't, I won't get in there and grade all those answers. And then I always do group feedback. When I read your reading guides, I noticed we had a lot of trouble with question number five. Let me uh, talk to you a little bit about that. Um, I am not sure how I'd make that work on a big class. So, you know, maybe when we're talking a little bit later, somebody will have some ideas about whether that could or couldn't work. Um, the videos, you know, are the one I have uh, in this little PowerPoint I created in Zoom. So I just opened up a Zoom meeting and I started talking, uh, saved it to my computer, and then I ran it through Stream to get the, the closed captions. Um, when I put it into this PowerPoint, uh, again, it was inserting, it was inserting a web link. So, so that, that same move as in Blackboard, give it a name, give it the URL and submit. There is tons and tons of help on creating and using videos at um, this, uh, this website. It's a UIW website that uh, our technology people have put together. Um, but Blackboard has, uh, is getting testy about the, so the amount of stuff we can post, which is why there's a new, you know, they used, to say they, they used to say they didn't care, you can post as much as you want. And so it really didn't matter if you posted a great big fat uh, video file uh, that was um, huge in, in size. Um, but now it does, uh, they're charging us money, there are limits and so on. So if you, if you post links, you just never get into trouble that way. Um, and I got in the habit of posting links because I also didn't want to worry about copyright things. So, you know, I can say, go look at this thing out online. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't have to have permission for them to do that. So there are a lot of reasons to use links, but it's my own, when it's my own work, uh, it's because, uh, I want to keep the, I, I don't want to be putting big files on my PowerPoint. 
are on my Blackboard site. And then um, for sharing, um, so if we're going to use a discussion board activity, a, 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 a reading guide activity to kind of fuel, um, fuel some student discussion, it's useful to think about uh, the tools you use. So if you're teaching an asynchronous class, they have pretty much can meet whenever they want, um, probably a discussion board question. But in the, the complaint most of us have about dis the student's discussion board um, postings is they're pretty superficial and undeveloped. And so this can help a little bit with this. Uh, Padlet's another option for sharing work. It's, it's the one I'm going to be using. Um, and uh, you, you think of it as a great big bulletin board. Uh, you have a little Padlet account. You do have to, let, I'll go through the how to and then we'll get up, talk about the account. So you create a little bulletin board thing. I create a new one for each assignment, give it a title, uh, and then they post their, their small piece of work. Um, my students will be meeting in teams of three on their own outside of class time and their instructions will be to post their their team assignment to Padlet. Um, you have to, so there is a freebie Padlet out there, but only let you create one Padlet, which isn't very useful if you're teaching. Incarnate Word uh, has a, a site license for Padlet, but uh, you need to ask uh, Terry or Adela for it. it you, you don't get it in through Cardinal Apps. Uh, but the turnaround is very quick and then you've got your you've got your account and then the, finally there's flipgrid works similarly to um padlet in uh, it it both does more and does less so flipgrid the only thing students can post are videos but they can make the videos right there on on flipgrid so it's a pretty nice tool if you want them to be doing um if you want them to be doing a little video responses, which they love to do. Okay, shall we talk a little bit? I can't see the chat. Maybe I can end the, uh, get out a full screen. And um, if I end the show, I end the closed captioning. So I don't want to do that. So Adela, can you tell me if there's anything in the chat we should? Um, just earlier, I played your video. Um, you know, you know, in some I, I, would you say it again, Adele? I didn't hear you. At the beginning when you were playing your video? Yeah. It, it wasn't showing. We could hear it. Really? Oh, my I, goodness. I, I think you're okay. your power. I wonder what power. happened, because when I... Uh, <coughs> have you got any insight into that, Adele? Well, uh, you might just be sharing your PowerPoint instead of your desktop. Yeah, I guess that's probably what I was doing. So it was it was a bad uh, bad sharing screen move because when I when I practiced it myself, I could see the video perfectly. So uh, okay, I'll have to get better at sharing my screen. Thank you. That's it. That's that window. Okay. Well, we're all going to get out a little bit early today then, and that's hardly the end of the world. We've got a million things to do. I, I have a question, Susan, about... Uh, yeah. If, uh, is there some way that you can get out the information to us about the not putting the videos on Blackboard? Because that was the first I'd heard of it, that we weren't supposed to do that when we were in the Flipped Academy. So I don't think people know about that. No, they don't. It's a new thing. And Adela, you guys are going to be doing all kinds of things to raise awareness, right? Oh. Um, as a matter of fact, if anyone has a course that's larger than two gigs, um, it's it's not going to it's not going to fit in Blackboard anymore. So, what do you do? You guys have anything planned to help people know about this? Yes, we're, we've come up with some uh, tutorials that we'll be sending out, and I'm sure we'll have a couple of these um, two o'clock workshops will be devoted to yeah. that. Yeah, and th Bonnie, this is a new thing. It just came down this summer. Uh, okay, yeah. Black uh, had no rule. 
when you talked about uh, <clears throat> sending only links, so you yes. saved it. You saved it to your YouTube channel. Is that what you saved it to, or, or? I don't do anything that that uh, fancy. Some people do. All I do is in Blackboard, I create what's called a web link. So you go to that create content button, and instead of uh, creating a file, you create a web link. And it, the first box asks you for the name of your file. The second box asks you for the URL. You hit submit. And when what students see is a name and a place to click, so it's pretty. But Susan, are, yeah. you, are these your own videos, or are you sharing other videos with? Them? I do. I guess I, the, I think the question is, if we record our own videos now, where are we supposed to link them from? I, you know, my own. I I would link. You know, I put it into OneDrive, and then a uh, link from okay. there. Okay. Put it in. Yes. You know. That that was the question. Okay, sorry, I missed the boat there, Gil. No, that's fine. That's fine. So, so Dr. No. Hinosa, yes, you can link from your YouTube account, or you can save them, upload them into your OneDrive account, and then link them from there. You'll just click. Uh, you'll just share it. You click share. Uh, it gives you a link, and then you bring that link uh, down into Blackboard, just as Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Hall mentioned. Yeah, that's fine. You know, I have never done the OneDrive save for that, but that's a that's a good place. It's it's a little more complicated when you have to upload it to your uh, to a YouTube channel. But the OneDrive sounds like an easier way. Okay. I find it pretty easy. Yeah. I have a question, and and the security for that is okay. Then linking to your OneDrive account. Yes, uh, Microsoft has absolutely uh, fantastic. Uh, security so that's not a problem at all one other question when i was first uploading videos i was doing it through blackboard to kaltura and cesar martinez uh cesar hernandez he said that um that he would like to do that because then it, it made it easier for people with different platforms to look at it or something like that um can you comment on that the kaltura served as a repository um just like your stream account, which is another, which is a video repository set up by Black, by uh, uh, set up by uh, Microsoft, or uh, your OneDrive. It's just a, it's just a repository for storage, um, and so we're kind of um, we're looking, at, you know, we're like looking at people who are trying to use Stream or their OneDrive a lot more. So just skip, so skip so using Kaltura from now on. Just don't use Kaltura at all. Just do the link to OneDrive. That would that would be fine. Yes, that would be. And fine. and next week we'll also talk about using Stream. So that's a like a Kaltura for Microsoft. So you can use OneDrive, like we're talking about. You can use Stream. You know, there's and we'll talk about what Stream looks like next week. But but either one is fine. The thing about links that makes them nicer in a way is that you can edit the video but the link doesn't change. Ah, that's, that's nice. Yeah, so you can do all the edits you want. Like Susan, she could edit her PowerPoint and, and she doesn't have to re-upload it. It's the same link. That's the beauty of not embedding it. Uh, and tomorrow we're talking about, um, I, I'll be doing the uh, narrated PowerPoint piece again. And there is an option in your narrated PowerPoint uh, that you can just, okay narrate the PowerPoint and then directly upload it into stream. And I'll be talking about that tomorrow. Reason to come. So I have a technical question from the student's perspective. Um, and I'm sorry, I, it's just, uh, if we, if we have it in Blackboard, I know like the students can download the, they can download stuff to watch it rather than trying to watch it live as it's streaming. If we do the link, do they have that option as well, or is that going to be a live stream? Because the the concern is for um, some of our students is their access to reliable internet. So if, if if we do, I can tell you for sure, stream you can download. Okay. The download option, yeah. Sorry, sorry, Susan. And and then again, the link they can always just access that at any time because they're just basically using. Um, using the internet to link it. Um, the other thing that you can do with uh, with OneDrive is, as, as Kathy said, is 
you can also share that link directly with students, so students can download it from from OneDrive from uh, with, Stream. With right. the link, you can open up. You open it up. You play it. You can do whatever you do with files. So you can save it. You can download it. You can put it wherever you want. Right. So the, the, the problem with some of that, and, and that's the reason I asked the question about the internet okay. access pieces. If you're streaming video, it requires much broader bandwidth. And it sometimes if you don't have good service, it doesn't play well and, and you can't get it all. If you can, you can simply open it on your desktop, save it and then reopen it and play. Right, right. so that's why I was asking, if you can download yeah. it, it, it saves them the, yeah. that problem. Yeah. So, okay, thanks. My question was kind of the flip side. Sometimes we have videos of patients doing something who may have signed their waiver to have their video shared with the students, not necessarily distributed to the students' own email accounts. So is there a way to prohibit downloading a video? Kathy, that one's yours. That's a really good question. And, and so you know what I'm going to do is, I, Jen, I'm going to actually ask um, our, um, um, our security guy, Brian Anderson, you know him. So, um, so yeah, so, and I'll find that out because that's a toughie. Um, I think in stream you can turn off the download, but people, you know, again, people can screen capture and all that. So, but let me check. And I mean, I don't think I'm taking a picture. I, I think with patient techniques, you're less likely to take a picture, it, but it, it is the patient's identity if I'm, if they're sharing like a whole video. No, that's true. So let me, let me just see if, for instance, in stream, if we can, um, I think, I think you can sort of like in YouTube, you can turn off the download um, um, option, but I'll, I'll double check that just to make sure. And I'll have that answer tomorrow. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so, uh, let, let me ask a question about, let's say you, you have a short clip and you embed it into, into PowerPoint and then you, 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 uh, this is, you, you upload it into Blackboard like you upload every other PowerPoint. And so, but now there's going to be a limit and we're going to, we're going to be talking about that. So Gil, you could take that PowerPoint save it to OneDrive, and upload the link to that okay. PowerPoint. Okay, that's good. Okay, I, got, I, have, I understand it now. Okay. Either, either the video by itself or in a PowerPoint. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, good. Because I usually do that, or I did that, in that I would be in the classroom, and I would click the next slide, and the video would start, you know, so. Yeah. And besides your video, I, I've seen your PowerPoints and you've got tons of images and wonderful stuff. And so I bet those are big files. So you might want- I'm sure they are, yeah. Using links. Susan, I wanna ask um, about uh, the idea of doing a check on the reader's guide uh, using Blackboard test, something yep. like that. Um, I'm envisioning, well, I use a lot of reader's guides and okay. uh, I'm envisioning the Blackboard test would, the Blackboard screen would, fill up with um, 30, 40 uh, different columns. Uh, is there a way to avoid that, to bundle them somehow, or are students used to seeing 30 or 40 different assignments on their Blackboard grade scheme sc screen as well? Ah, yes. Um, I think it's just columns way out to Atascosa, Atascosa County myself. And That's where they would go, yeah. Is a better way, but I, I don't know a better way to handle the grade book than that. I, yeah, I'm, there's not really a way to bundle them. Um, basically, they would just, now, just FYI, for your students, for you, you have column after column after column. But when the student looks at their grades, um, the only thing they see is their grade. So they'll have row after row after row of grades. So okay. it'll just mean that they have to, they've just got, you know, a okay. long list of things they have to page through. That makes sense. And so their display is e they vertical, won't be isn't it? that difficult for them to see where they've gone. Right. right. Okay. And Tim, do you know about bundling them in terms of grading them? No. Say you do. 30 um, reading guides and each one counts just a little bit. Um, 
You might want to think about having Blackboard drop the one lowest grade or the two lowest grades. Then you don't have to have conversations about all of the things that happen, you know? Mr. Thanks. Good. I'll do that. <laughs> yeah. and, and that's, uh, Tim, that's under the way grades option. So you yeah. would create like a reading guide category, and then you can drop grades from that reading grade guide category. Um, <laughs> Please feel free to call me. Uh, I can sit down with you, do a Zoom session, walk you through it, uh, and we can maybe get you set up for the. We can, we can definitely get you set up for the fall. Yeah, that sounds great. Hey, Susan. This is Lila. I have a question for you. Lila. Um. So I've been watching the closed caption box, and, and they're horrible, aren't they? Yeah. So, so my observation is that. Only when you're speaking, it seems like it's picking up. But if anybody had a question, or for example, when Terry or Kathy were speaking, it wasn't picking it up or not very well. So I don't know, are you the host? I mean, are you set up as the host and that's why it's picking you up well, but not everybody else? It's picking you up right now. Oh, is it? Okay. I, yeah, so I wasn't sure. So I was just wondering if students were asking questions, you know, during a question and answer time, not everybody who was speaking today was it was being captured. So I, I would say it's more about mumbling and about speaking clearly. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, Where's I'm a, I, by the way, can I, can I, can I I'm a mumbler. ask you a question? Where's that command for those for those uh, uh, subtitles? Susan, do you want to show? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if I can. Uh, what did you ask, Gil? Where's the command to do that? How do you turn that on? It, we ran it through stream. Okay, walk me through this, Kathy. So I have to be. I have to have a smaller screen, right? Uh huh. Just go. Just go to your PowerPoint. Show your PowerPoint, but not in presentation mode. Okay. Um, See, Lila. If people speak slowly and clearly, like Susan, <laughs> then it will. Pick the captions will be correct. If you mumble like me, that's oh, well, it's capturing you really well right now. Kathy. That's because I'm trying yeah. to speak, <laughs> not mumble. I uh, uh, this is beyond me. I can't even find my PowerPoint now. <laughs> so, so, so okay, there it is. Perfect. Okay, All right, so. let's see. Let's get you folks out of the way. Uh, where is this, Kathy? I it's forgot. under slide, a slideshow at the top. Oh, yes. Yeah. So you have to be in that tab. Yep. Absolutely. And there captions you are. Captions and subtitles. Yep. Right. And, and just, then I'll use yeah. subtitle. So you get a drop down. And, um, and then you've got, Susan, if you go to subtitle settings. Okay. Right there again. And it will ask you, see there. You're tell, it says what your spoken language is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because Susan actually set this up yesterday. You did. I did set it up yesterday. Thank you, master I master mean, ball. I am, uh, I am living proof that practice makes perfect, and I haven't had practice yet. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I did set it up yesterday. But um, And you can say where you want it to show up. So, you know, but you have to pick, you know, for the whole presentation. Uh, and I do find that now that I'm starting to use these, I have to think a little bit more about how the slide looks to make sure that something important isn't going to be covered by the by the captioning. Right. So that was my my second uh, question or, or point was that sometimes the box was over some of your part of your slide, and so my question was, that, but obviously we can based on what you're showing right now. So that yeah, so you can, you know, and so now, since it's a new tool to me, I'm, a, you know, I'm an imperfect user. And uh, next time I do it, I'll probably think a little bit more clearly from the beginning, where are these, where are these captions going to be, and make sure I leave some, some white space for them. And to be honest, this was an old, uh, old-ish PowerPoint I had that I had jazzed up for this event and uh, really didn't think about the, where the captions would, would go. So, um, yeah. The other thing, Lila, about the captions, it seems to me that they, uh, 
they have particular difficulty with uh, technical language. Uh, so they're a little better with everyday language. And the other thing I noticed, because I was, I was going through a bunch of the ones in the Flip ca Academy, somebody needed some for something, um, and that it appears to me the captioning learns, uh, you know, that they would mess up uh, some, uh, uh, let's say, uh, anatomical term um, the first two or three times and then start getting it. And so I'm thinking that if I were going to be really serious about this, I might, you know, maybe uh, say some of my technical terms on a practice slide beforehand, kind of teach the captioner how to say things, and then uh, delete that slide and uh, hope that things oh, won't be. Yeah. Who would be the audience for this? That's right. After the announcement about the For the captioning? That's right. Uh, we had an we had a it, we had a request today to have closed captionings from a faculty. Oh, I see. Well, yeah. Would you ask a student? Would you ask the class if they need captioning? Is that okay? There are, two, there are two philosophies on that. So the universal design philosophy says design as much into what you're given to everybody as you possibly can, so that you minimize students' need to ask. That is the dominant philosophy. Um, the other philosophy is the accommodations philosophy. You have somebody who come, you know, has accommodations with the university. So they, um, they, let's say, are learning. Uh, they are. Uh, they may be learning disabled, and reading this could be helpful to them as well as seeing it. Uh, and they ask for it. Um, uh, there's a lot more simply just making it available for everyone. Okay. Thanks. Huh? Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions, comments? Hey, so